from early childhood, from about 11 or 12 years old, I already had some in personal, perhaps independent, if you like, interest in spirituality. Um, I remember when I was about 13, I would be sitting up in my bed in the morning or late at night thinking what I was. Was I the body? Was there a soul? Was there a God? And I would pray to God from a, perhaps a, a Christian point of view, perhaps. A, whatever you are, I know you're not limited to one religion or another. You can't be because you're God. But whatever you are, please reveal yourself to me so I can understand and please let me live on after life. So I had this... Um, general inherent belief I think in God and, and spirituality uh, before I came to Krishna consciousness that was my own little version my own embryonic form of Krishna consciousness uh, I would sing in church choirs as well uh, when I was younger although by the time I got to about 16 17 my focus of course was on exams at school and doing a lot of dramas a lot and a lot of dramas my grandmother uh, had met Sai Baba uh, my grandmother's and well, my grandfather rather had been in India during the 1940s for historical reasons, um, but they kept friends with an Indian family since the Second World War, and they that particular family were devotees of Sai Baba. So anyway, my mom went, my nan went to to India, met Sai Baba, and you know the experiences she had were mixed, but nevertheless inspirational in their own right. So I had a few books written by him, by Sai Baba, and. I felt there was something in it here, not necessarily, I, I did feel there was something wrong with it as well because he was talking about himself as God and, and that didn't seem to be right. But in terms of the culture and the spirituality and the overall teachings, the concept of karma, reincarnation uh, and vegetarianism and, and so forth and non-sectarianism, I felt there was definitely something there. I hadn't actually read the Bhagavad Gita um, until I was about 19, 20 years old, but about a few years before that, one Iskon devotee had sold me a copy of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto, on the streets of a small English town called Bromsgrove. There was a nearby temple in the big city of Birmingham, uh, England's largest, second largest city after London. And there was a, they were obviously going outreach to the smaller English towns doing book distribution. So I had this Bhagavatam and I was curious. Of course, the, the Iskon, the Hare Krishna devotees, when compared with other religions uh, were different because this was Eastern, this was something a bit more colourful, a bit more exotic and certainly um, more attractive to me actually for that reason uh, because I felt that the, the Abrahamic traditions had their limitations anyway. So I was at home and I read the Bhagavatam and I realised this was the voice of an older intelligence. But when I actually read, I, someone sold me a copy of the Bhagavad Gita on the streets of Birmingham and it was quite a hot day. I mean, when I say hot day, I'm talking about English hot, which means about 29 degrees. That's about as hot as it gets in England. That's about normal. Maybe that's a winter day for uh, India. However, it was a hot day, but I, I, someone gave me a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. I chatted with that devotee for about half an hour. And I, I had respect for ISKCON by then, because I'd already read, of course, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto. And... I passed out in the street with the, uh, with the Gita in my hand. I don't know why that happened. I don't think it was because of the heat. I've never, during my time in India, I've never passed out in the heat. And <laughs> but this was an English um, day, and <laughs> there I was, just passed out in the street. And when I came around, I was lying on my back with the Gita, Prabhupada Gita, on my chest, surrounded by all these shoppers um, and also a few of the devotees. The devotees took me said, oh, Prabhu, have you been fasting? I went, I'm fasting, i never fasted before in my life. But they sat me down, they gave me a couple of halva, and they showed me the Sankatan van, and, and so forth, and I was interested, but I, I shook their hand, I, I appreciated the Gita, I promised them I'd read it, and I enjoyed the halva, I enjoyed the prasadam. However, I never really took religion too seriously, because I felt that my path was self-exploration, rather than anything else. So I kept the Gita there with me, a couple of years later, I found myself um, doing a degree in drama at Manchester University, or Ave University in Manchester, at least. Uh, Manchester is the third biggest English city. And I was staying there, and um, I think by about the second year, I was feeling perhaps a bit lonely. I had a lot of time for myself. And a lot of the other students on the course I was doing were maybe about a year younger than me. And but mentally even younger. And they came across as what we call in England prima donnas, which means they were 
interested in, in their own ego and their own fame and their own glory. Uh, whereas I myself was also a bit like that, but uh, not as much as they were. Uh, I, there was a depth in me, that perhaps, or a yearning for spirituality. So I used to spend weekends and evenings reading, of course, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, as it is, that same copy that I passed out with years earlier, and I read it for beginning, middle, end, perhaps in a very relatively short period of time, and the fact that it talked about the soul and the self, the inner self being the real self, and, 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 and so on and so forth, basically Krishna consciousness, really. And I thought, this is, this is the truth, this is something else. But still, I, I felt, well, I didn't want to surrender to chanting one particular mantra. I wanted to try my own mantras first. I thought, why should I listen to someone else's mantra? So I tried different forms of mantras. And, but I did, for my own experimentation, feel that the Hare Krishna mantra seemed to be the best one. It was the only one that you could continue to do without getting fed up. or It was the one that produced the best results. I did spend a year at university getting involved in various forms of mysticism from out-of-body experiences and, and so on and so forth but one day it was it, I later learned to be Gaur Panim there was a Harinam in the streets the high streets of Manchester and it hadn't been the first time I'd seen a Harinam I'd seen images I'd seen Harinams in London I'd seen Iskon devotees giving out books and sweets on Oxford Street in London and of course Harry Norm's there too, but at that time I was only about 13 years old and uh, it was something exotic and something that perhaps if the whole material world fell apart I might consider joining, but yeah, about 10 years after that, when I was about 21, I saw the Harry Norm in Manchester and they got a good book, it was all, uh, the leaflet was all about free feasting and eat as much as you like and, and dancing and free vegetarian food and all that kind of stuff. Now, incidentally, along with my manta experimentation, I had become a vegetarian largely due to the influence of a girl I was not particularly serious with, but I was seeing, and she was vegetarian. And I think, but, uh, surrounded by bohemian style, uh, semi-pretentious, but then again well-mannered and well-thinking drama students, there was a lot of vegetarianism, veganism in the atmosphere at the time, and I became a vegetarian. But it was difficult for me to be vegetarian as well. I couldn't cook to save my life. I could manage a, a pasta and some toast, perhaps. But <laughs> I was a young student, and I perhaps hadn't really um, lived long enough to learn very much about cooking. Anyway, um, I started going to the Manchester Hare Krishna Temple. And I, I, I took the prashadam, I liked the prashadam, I, I liked the people, the dancing and the philosophy, of course, and which, of course, was um, a confirmation or a, a further explanation, an extra level of depth of study, of course, of the Bhagavad Gita and, of course, the Srimad Bhagavatam as well. And I was very lucky, I learned later, I was very lucky because um, some of the speakers at the temple at the time were very good. And I tried to do, I thought, well, this is my religion now. I'm going to go here all the time. This is great stuff. So I would go and go and go. I got involved. I actually became homeless about six months later. Um, there was due to the fact that other students in my accommodation were, um, other students were, um, how would you say, experimenting with intoxication. Of course, nothing to do with me. But what happened was the, the place got closed down. Um, and we all got made we had to go and find our own way and that was a tough time for me but I started um, basically going on the food for life eating some of the food for life prashadam and I managed to find my way back into the house again after a few days and spent some days of course at the Manchester temple and that was great actually it was like a I remember doing the washing up in the basement of the temple there and I really felt that there was this lotus flower that was opening up and Krishna was sending me realizations at the beginning of my spiritual journey as often as he does. He was sending me free samples of self-realization. And I have to admit that was in many ways one of my most wonderful experiences in Krishna consciousness. And that's the beginning of it. That first pot of halva, that first subji, that first rice, that first pakora. It was wonderful actually. Um, at the end of the course, had, uh, by the time the course had finished, I was actually in a rock band at the time as well, by the way. And I tried and I tried, but of course it, that kind of lifestyle didn't match 
with the spiritual lifestyle. It did, uh, to me, th there seemed to be a contradiction, and at some point I had to make a choice. And I think after about a year after I finished university, I'd spent some time unemployed in Manchester, trying the rock and roll scene, but having that spiritual yearning, of course, and that grounding at the temple. So the course ended, I moved to the Birmingham Temple, because Birmingham was, of course, much nearer to where I'd been brought up, and it was nearer to my family as well. And I just so happened, when I was in the, the Birmingham Temple, um, my mum and dad came to see me, and they thought, what's, what's, what's Richard, what's he getting into now? You know, he's, what's happening, what's he doing? You know, so they came to see me, and I wasn't expecting them to visit the Birmingham Temple. You know, we're talking about a middle, middle-aged, middle-class English couple here, and there they managed to find me, polishing the floor on my hands and knees, wiping the floor in front of Lord Juggernaut, like this. And my mum was amazed because she, because she kind of confirmed I'd never done a bit of washing or wiping in my life before. I'd never done any washing up or anything like that as a teenager. So here was her son wearing a dhoti uh, on his ha her, my hands and knees, sweeping the floor like that and mopping the floor on my hands and knees. And I didn't see her. She was watching me going, oh, my God, what's happened to my son? And I think there was both, both positive and negative. Both, this is wonderful, look what he's doing. He's actually doing some work for once in his life. But also negative, because what's he, this is strange. What's he getting into? And then I had the floor. And then I was on the floor, and then I saw my mother's feet. And I looked up. Oh, hello, Mum. And it was that sense of, oh, my God, this is embarrassing. And in the end, of course, um, the temple president of, of the Birmingham temple at the time looked after my parents, gave them some prasadam, and they kind of reluctantly, I think, accepted my direction. I said, Mom, I'm going to go to India and become a yoga teacher. But around that time, Gaur Swami, the late Gaur Swami, was passing through, and he gave a lecture um, that evening in the temple, and it was a wonderful lecture, but I think a bit too highbrow, a bit too spiritual for my parents, but they could see that what I was getting into had some depth and they appreciated that. They could see that he was a senior person, this wasn't just a young Hare Krishna, this was, there were senior Hare Krishnas, learned Hare Krishnas, gurus in fact. And that same night, the same weekend rather, there was a drama from the Bhaktivedanta Players Drama Group, which was based at Bhaktivedanta Manor near London, the famous Bhaktivedanta Manor. I saw the drama, I liked the drama very much. And then, but I didn't think about going to the manor at that time. What happened was I ended up touring India, or touring, um, I think going to Bhubaneswar in Orissa, Jagannathpuri. We were touring around Europe, and of course India with Gaur Swami. And that, of course, that was great. That was, really was my foundation of class sitting, three or four hour classes at a time. That was when I was, they say, really fired up. I'm not sure if I'm as fired up now, but that was my fanatical period. That was just great. I, met, I got to wash Gaur Swami's feet and all sorts. Anyway. When I came back I, from that tour, I ended up, of course, at Bhaktivedanta Manor. I thought, these smaller temples in Birmingham, Manchester, all very well, but I needed a drama group. I was an actor, or a frustrated actor, or an amateur actor, whatever I was. And I wanted the real McCoy. So I joined Bhaktivedanta Manor about 20 years ago, that's in about 1984. And I joined the drama group uh, during a, the, one of the biggest Jamastami festivals, actually, in the world outside of India and perhaps one of the most organised in the world. Um, a huge, huge Jamasmi festival with exhibitions, bazaars, darshan entertainment, um, you name it, it happens at Bhaktivedanta Manor Jamasmi festival. And I took part in the drama there, Boy George I think was singing, and, and not, Boy George was a famous English singer, but especially more famous in the 1980s. But anyway, um, this for, I'm, there's no going back now, I'm a Hare Krishna, this is my life, this is my religion, uh, this this is it, and uh, you know it was a, a relatively easy path for me. But it wasn't too easy to give up. It was as you give up material life. It was a a, um, a journey that took several years, as I've described. But Bhaktivedanta Manor also captivated me in its own way. It was during the years when Bhaktivedanta Manor was fighting a struggle um, to st remain open. The local council trying to close it down due to it becoming too popular and attracting too much traffic. So I found myself on this huge demonstration in central London, in, in uh, Westminster, with about 35 or 37,000 Hindus, Jains and Sikhs and Iskand devotees marching on the British Parliament to protest against the closure of Bhaktivedanta Manor. 
after that, after that huge march, everything else from a judicial or legal point of view appeared to go in back to Lantamana's favour. And my back to programme, although did involve washing pots, also involved um, perhaps getting involved in the background as a young devotee in the campaign to save the manor. I've been at the manor ever since, and I do PR work. Of course, I'm a, an actor uh, with the Back to Hunter Players Drama Group, still at the manor. And I have to admit, going looking back those years, um, the, the choice I made, I think, to buy that Gita off the streets of Birmingham, off that devotee, was probably the lynch point. In our lives, sometimes we reach forks. Shall I go this way? Shall I go that way? Shall I do this? Do I do this job, that job, that course, this course, marry this person, whatever it might be. And we always have choices in our life. So when I chose to uh, buy and study a copy of the Gita, I think that was one of those forks in the road about 25 years ago now. And I have to admit it was the best choice I think I've ever made because Krishna looks after his devotees. Not necessarily always as materially, but spiritually, and that's what actually matters. And I'm still, of course, um, in that learning process, uh, developing my faith, developing my bhakti, um, according to my conditioning and, and realizing as well that it's a long journey, but it's not an eternal journey. It does come to an end. There is a conclusion. There is a source, which is Krishna. And we have to be patient with ourselves, patient when we cannot achieve as much as we want to achieve or we don't make much advancement or we, whatever it might be. But we can be realize we've been on this earth for so many thousands and millions of lifetimes. We can, ha we do have to be patient with ourselves and our spiritual lives. At the same time, we have to have faith that we are making progress. Anyway, that's my story of coming to Iskar. Hare Krishna.